All right, can you hear me okay? Is that working? Great, very good. Well, welcome everybody this morning. This is a, a, oh, is that better? Okay, fantastic, very good. This is a, a talk, um, I don't know, if, who's heard of Voices for Freedom in New Zealand? Yeah, okay. We had a whole group of those come around to our place recently, about 15 in our lounge. And so this is a talk to help explain to them <coughs> what we know as Adventists from prophecy, who's really behind what's going on. So it's, it's an overview, it's not in depth, but I pray you'll get something out of it. So let's um, bow our heads and we'll just invite the Holy Spirit again to be with us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that as we open your word and study prophecy and history, Lord, may we understand and appreciate the times we're living in that we can get an overview of where we are and an indication that you're coming very soon. So we ask you to be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So are we living in what we'd call unprecedented times? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know there's some stats coming out. You've probably heard of a little thing called COVID-19. And as a result of that... <laughs> A worldwide vaccine was rolled out. And, you know, there's a lot of stats coming out now, which are actually quite scary. These are actually from a few months ago. But this, for example, this is a report of stillbirths from the Open VAERS database. And you can see the average going along for many years. Then suddenly, in 2021, what happened? Huge, big spike. Look at some other data. For example, the incidence of myo or pericarditis. Notice what happened. Fairly steady. Then 2021, what happened? Boom, through the roof. Here's uh, mortality reports from vaccines. Look at that. Boom. And the mainstream media is now reporting in places. This is from the German National Association of Statutory Health Insurance Physicians. They're saying the number of people who died suddenly and unexpectedly skyrocketed. And here's some stats from that. This is from Germany, for example. These are sudden and unexpected deaths. In other words, people with no health conditions suddenly dropping dead. And look at the numbers. Boom. Huge increase. And there's other strange things starting to happen in the world. For example, there's cases, this is from the World Health Organization, acute hepatitis amongst young people. People with no contact with hepatitis are suddenly getting hepatitis. And this is from the report. The conclusion was, this is the conclusion, the World Health Organization report, COVID-19 vaccination can elicit a distinct T-cell dominant immune-mediated hepatitis with a unique, and so it goes on. In other words, the vaccine can cause hepatitis in some people, even though they're never exposed to it. Strange things. What about the effects on our day-to-day -day lives? Have you been in shops recently and seen this sort of thing? Empty shelves with a sign that says, due to supply chain disruptions, things aren't available. And we did see for a long time these sort of signs up. You still see them in shops, the barcode to scan in, the, you know, the QR code, and signs that says you need a vaccine pass. Thankfully, we don't need those anymore, but you still see the signs posted here and there. So is it getting harder to buy and sell? Our price is going up. It's going crazy, isn't it? You know, the Bible talked about there would come a time when there would be this power that would cause everyone to receive a mark in their right hand or their forehead that you couldn't buy or sell unless you had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So is buying and selling becoming more difficult? Yes. Is the COVID vaccine the mark of the beast? No, absolutely not. Definitely not. When you study what prophecy means by that, it's not the mark of the beast. Is there a power in the world that wants to enforce a mark? Absolutely, yes. Could the COVID measures be preparing the way, conditioning people to enforce a mark? And I believe absolutely, yes. Now, here's a radical question. Does the evidence indicate that the same entity wanting to enforce the mark is also behind the COVID crisis? And I believe absolutely yes. 
And lastly, does the Bible identify this entity or system or power? And the answer is yes. So where in the Bible is this system pointed out? And you know, yes, exactly, Daniel, Revelation, also Thessalonians and other places. Yes. So this is the overview I shared with those folk, showing how frequently God identifies this system Within the Bible, God wants us to pay attention. He mentions it in Daniel, Revelation, other places. For example, the book of Daniel, where do we find a clue of this? Even in chapter 2, the overview of world history. Remember the legs of iron representing the empire, the pagan empire of Rome, the imperial empire of Rome. And then it changed. About the ankles, something was introduced. So the iron changed to a mixture of iron and clay, didn't it? But the iron was still there. In fact, the Bible itself says, Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. In other words, the iron continues right to the end. So there's some element from the pagan Roman Empire, even in Daniel chapter 2, as indicated, goes right to the end of time. Do we see the Roman soldiers parading in our streets anymore? No. <laughs> that's history. That's gone. But there's still some element of the Roman Empire is still present today. Even up to the point when the stone comes down and smites the image. What about Daniel chapter 7? You've got these four beasts that come up out of the sea representing the same kingdoms as represented in Daniel chapter 2. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome, and then the divided kingdom. And that last beast had horns coming out of its head. And the Bible explains the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings or kingdoms that shall arise. And then up pops something else. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. And this little horn would reign for 1,260 years, we're told. There's the Bible code, time, times, and dividing of time. And this little horn is actually part of that fourth beast. Is that right? And that fourth beast represented Rome. So it grew out of that beast. And again, that little horn is going to be there right up until the time. In verse 11 it says, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So that little horn power is going to be there right until Jesus destroys it at the second coming. Who was that little horn? Now, we as Adventists today are probably pretty much, uh, I don't know, there's not many voices identifying who this is except the Adventist church. But, you know, this was common knowledge. Here's from Sir Isaac Newton. You've probably heard of Sir Isaac Newton. He actually wrote more on theology than he did on science. And he said this, It was a kingdom of a different kind from the other ten kingdoms, having a life or soul peculiar to itself with eyes and a mouth, by its eyes it was a seer, by its mouth speaking great things and changing times and laws it was a prophet as well as a king. And such a seer, a prophet and a king is the Church of Rome. He knew who this was. Then you come to Daniel chapter 8. Remember the vision there where Daniel saw this ram pushing and then suddenly a goat comes flying along and smites the ram. And then out of that comes this horn which grew. It says it waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. So here's this horn power conquering. But then it changes. We see here in verse 10, it waxed great, speaking about that horn, even to the host of heaven. So look at this. First of all, it's pushing southwards, eastwards. Do you see that? And then suddenly, which direction is it going? It's going up up to the host of heaven and cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped on them. So this is a change in nature of that kingdom. But again, the Bible says, he shall be broken without hand. And without hand means div by divine power. So that's in the book of Daniel. Then you come to the book of Revelation. And we find something interesting there. Just get my clicker working again. We find in chapter 13 this beast coming up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. 
And if you go through all the clues in the Bible about this particular beast power, there's an inescapable conclusion. It's exactly the same as the little horn. It reigns for the same length of time, the same thing happens to it. And you might have heard of John Wesley, world-famous figure, helped start the Methodist Church. He said this, O oh, reader, this is a subject wherein we also are deeply concerned and which must be treated not as a point of curiosity, but as a solemn warning from God. The danger is near. This beast is the Romanish papacy. So here's another indication in Bible prophecy of the same power. Then you come to chapter 17, and we discover this harlot woman, a woman sitting on a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And this woman was drunken with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. In Bible prophecy, what does a woman represent? A church, exactly. So what church is known to ride the beast or the civil powers and is drunken with the blood of the saints? Exactly, there's only one entity. So once again, here's another example in the Bible of where Rome was identified through Bible prophecy. So God again and again and again is identifying this power because this is the key power to watch when it comes to the corruptions in the world. And it fits the prophecy so well. It says in Revelation 18, All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of your fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Do we see Rome's influences everywhere? Yes. Absolutely. But you know, Rome has a helper. We find in Revelation 13 there's a second beast. That top one is that first beast, which is the power of Rome. But now there's another one that comes out of the earth. This one, it says, he comes up out of the earth and had two horns like a lamb. Well, that's good. Who's the lamb in Bible prophecy? Exactly. And it's interesting what John Wesley said about this power. He was writing about 1750. Four, you can see on the date there he wrote some notes. He wrote a book called Notes on the New Testament. So in 1754, he wrote about this second beast. And he said, he is not yet come, though he cannot be far off, for he is to appear at the end of the 42 months of the first beast. John Wesley actually went to what was called in those days the colonies in North America. And he ministered there, perhaps not realizing that he was standing on the land where this beast would rise up. Now, why should we be worried about the identity of this particular beast? Why should it concern us? It's because it says he spake as a dragon. And of course, from Bible prophecy, who's the dragon? <laughs> exactly, the devil himself. And it says he, speaking about this other beast, exercised all the power of the first beast. And who was the first beast? It was the papacy. And he doeth great wonders and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles. So this power is going to do miraculous things to deceive. Saying to them that dwell on the earth, they should make an image to the beast. And he had power to give life to the image of the beast. And cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And this is why this is important to understand who this power is. And of course, that's another whole topic. But to summarize, this beast is none other than the United States in Bible prophecy. So these are the two powers that are going to work together. Now people say, but what about Islam? Or what about communism? Communism controls a lot of the world. North Korea, China, Russia. Aren't they the big threat at the moment? What about Islam? Look at the influence Islam has had. And sure, those are players, but who are the two key players that the Bible identifies as the ones that are going to bring on the last crisis? It's these two people here. It's interesting that the USA was founded on godly principles. It came up like a lamb. The Declaration of Independence in 1776. Then they had the Constitution in 1787. And the Bill of Rights four years later. And the people that framed these documents understood, by looking back at the Dark Ages, they could see the abuses and the horrors that went on when you combine church and state. And here's some of the statements from some of these 
leading founders of the United States. It says, when a religion is good, I conceive that it will support itself. And when it cannot support itself, and God does not take care to support, so that its professors are obliged to call for the help of the civil power, tis a sign I apprehend of its being a bad one. <laughs> does that make sense? If God doesn't prop up a church so they have to go to the government for help, that's not a good sign. George Washington said this, I've often expressed my sentiment that every man conducting himself as a good citizen and being accountable to God alone for his religious opinions ought to be protected in worshipping the deity according to the dictates of his own conscience. Fantastic. Well, I mean, we take these principles for granted. What religion you choose to adhere to is your business. So the constitution they framed guarantees religious liberty. Very, very smart document this. It says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Fantastic principle. Or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances. Wonderful foundational principles, but sadly they're being eroded, aren't they? Now contrast these principles with the principles of the Roman Catholic system. For example, here's something Pope Pius VII said. It was proposed, and notice the date when this was done. This is 1808, so this is like very shortly after the United States declared independence and wrote up the Constitution. This is the response to that. It was proposed that all religious persuasion should be free and their worship publicly exercised. But we have rejected this article as contrary to the canons and councils of the First Catholic Church. In other words, you cannot choose your religion according to the Roman Catholic system. Here's another pope saying the same thing. The state has not the right to leave every man free to embrace whatever religion he shall deem true. The church has the right to require that the Catholic religion shall be the only religion of the state to the exclusion of all others. Pretty, pretty blatant, isn't it? They, you don't hear words quite like that at the moment. Since Vatican II, they've toned it down, but the principles haven't changed. They still adhere to these thoughts. Interesting, that same Pope put together what was called the Syllabus of Errors, and you can look this up. This is all public knowledge. And what he did was he combined... Um, statements and paragraphs from previous popes and he put together a list of things that he called errors in other words wrong ways of thinking and it's quite revealing what he said sorry about the highlighting on that it's wrong shading there actually give me half a second I'll fix that we'll put better shading on that so it doesn't look quite so ugly <laughs> that's better there we go. So, error number 15. Now, in, think about the statement on its own. Every man is free to embrace or profess that religion which, guided by the light of reason, he shall consider true. Is that a good statement? I believe that's a good principle. But according to Pope Pius IX, this is an error to think that. Another one, error number 24. The church has not the power of force nor has she any temporal power. What does temporal power mean? That means civil power. Exactly. Nor has she any temporal or civil power, direct or indirect. And to that we say, Amen. The church should not get involved in politics or running the country. But this is an error according to Pope Pius IX. Now here's the thing. If you adopt the principle that, first of all, you cannot choose your religion, you must be forced to be Roman Catholic, and the Roman Church has the power to use force, where does that logically lead to? What's the end result of believing as Pope Pius IX expressed here? Absolutely. This, this is the logical result you'll end up. And this is what took place in Europe for hundreds and hundreds of years. That they believe they can force you to be Catholic, 
and they can use the power of the state to make sure that happens. And you think, well, maybe surely that was just the Dark Ages. Well, how about this a Roman Catholic bishop living in the United States, guaranteed religious liberty in the 1850s. What did he say? No man has the right to choose his religion. The thinking is still there. Now the question is asked, how could religious laws be passed in the USA contrary to the Constitution? You know, there's a push, strong push to get rid of the Constitution. Here's an article from the New York Times. Let's give up on the Constitution. It's going to be quite a battle, but people are pushing. There's voices saying we don't need the Constitution. It's antiquated. It's out of date. And interesting who wrote this article was this gentleman here, a guy called Louis Michael Seidman. And his position, you can see, he, well anyway, let's read what he says. He says, no one can predict in detail what our system of government would look like if we, get this, freed ourselves from the shackles of constitutional obligation. Now let's pause for a second. What's he saying here? He said we should be free from the shackles of the Constitution. <laughs> now let's pause for a second. Who does the Constitution shackle? Is it the population? Exactly, exactly. The Constitution shackles the government. It's to prevent government having power over the citizens, overreaching its, its, its control. You understand? So why would you want to free, be freed from the shackles of the Constitution unless you wanted to bring in oppressive power? He says, even if we can't kick our constitutional law addiction, <laughs> we can soften the habit. In other words, let's tone down the Constitution. Why would you want to do that when the Constitution guarantees freedom and restrains the government? And it's interesting, he is, notice his job position there, he's Georgetown University constitutional law professor. So he teaches constitutional law at Georgetown University. A lot of the presidents have studied at Georgetown University. Does anyone know anything about Georgetown University? <laughs> Absolutely. This is all public knowledge. You can look this up online. Here's Wikipedia, not the greatest source in the world, but there you go. It says it's a private Jesuit university. So
Fantastic, that's in our Bill of Rights. Sadly, what we saw happen in the last couple of years, despite this being enshrined in the Bill of Rights, how do they get around that? <laughs> yes, they used companies and government departments just to run rough, roughshod over this. It's, it's, it's shocking. So how will this affect us as we move forward? Spirit of Prophecy says, the agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world and the final movements will be rapid ones. Interesting, looking on social media, people saying the world seems to be a different place today. Have you, have you noticed that? People saying the world has changed. And just in the last couple of years, it feels like a different place now. So who's actively carrying out these plans? Who's the, who's the military arm, if you like, of the Roman Catholic Church? And we don't have to guess. Here's some great controversy. This is talking about when the Protestant Reformation had begun and was making huge dents in the Roman Catholic system. It says, Throughout Christendom, Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. The first triumphs of the Reformation passed, Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created. The most cruel, unscrupulous and powerful of all the champions of popery, cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason and conscience wholly silenced, they knew no rule, no tie but that of their order, and no duty but to extend its power. It was the fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the means. Is that a Christian principle? No. Absolutely not. Totally not. But this is a principle of the Jesuit order. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination, not only pardonable but, all, but commendable when they served the interests of the church. Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state climbing up to be the counsellors of kings and shaping the policy of nations. Do you get that? Their role is to shape the policy of nations, to become counsellors to kings, to get into offices of state. The Jesuits rapidly spread themselves over Europe, and wherever they went, there followed a revival of popery. Now, can we say, well, thankfully, that's gone now. The Jesuits don't exist anymore. Is that right? <laughs> Afraid not. This is the current head of the Jesuits on the right here, speaking to another Jesuit who's the head of the Catholic Church. Here's the head of the Jesuits. He's actually from South America as well. And we don't have to guess what they adhere to. This is, this is public knowledge. This is from the Australian government archives. You can look at this online. This is publicly available information. And this is the Jesuit oath. You can see here, a bit hard to read, um, but in the middle of that it talks about, well, let's go through some of the things. It talks a lot about secrecy in this. Can you see up the top it says, the mother church's interest to keep secret and private all her agents. And down the bottom here, I will secretly use the poisonous cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the poignard or the leaden bullet. And it talks about how ruthless they are. Notice this. I will spare neither age, sex or condition and I will hang, burn, waste, boil, flail, strangle and bury alive those infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of the women, crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate their inexorable race. Pretty ruthless. There's other documentation available online as well. This is not conspiracy theory. This is publicly available information. This is from archive.org. And somebody published the secret instructions of the Jesuits. And the reason they did this was, here's the introduction to it. This is published in 1888. This work is presented to the American people in the hope that it will aid in the good work of enlightenment and help in preserving and purifying our 
republican institutions from the blighting influence of foreign ecclesiastism, which under the guise of religion has corrupted and polluted every country and people we're ever permitted to establish itself. Americans heed the warning ere it be too late. Romanism and Jesuitism are inseparable. Where one is, there the other may be found secretly working to subvert and enslave. Read this book. Help spread it throughout the land that our countrymen may be forewarned. Forewarned is forearmed. So this is published to wake up Americans to the principles of Romanism and Jesuitism. You can go to the Jesuit website. This is straight off the Jesuit website. Who are the Jesuits, they ask? And they, they boast about how many members they have. The Society of Jesus is the largest order of priests and brothers in the Catholic Church with almost 17,000 members serving in 112 countries, 2,300 schools in 67 countries. 9% of the members of the US Congress are alumni of Jesuit colleges and universities. Now here's a list of all the different religious orders. Again, this is public knowledge. You can look this up. All the different religious orders in the Catholic Church. And down here, there's a line that says the Society of Jesus. It's the largest order within the Catholic Church. Now why should this concern us? Here's a quote from Great Controversy. The Roman Church is far-reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She's employing every device to extend her influence and increase her power in preparation for, notice this, a fierce and determined conflict. So they're ready for a battle. Two, notice this, regain control of the world, to re-establish persecution and to undo all that Protestantism has done. What has Protestantism done for us? Like today in New Zealand, let's be practical. What has Protestantism done for us? And I would say a huge amount. We don't understand the blessings we have. We have, for example, in our judicial system, if you go to court, you are typically tried by a jury. Is that right? Twelve of your peers selected from the community. Have you ever had to do jury service? You get called up, some people do occasionally, you get this letter in the mail, called up to be on a jury. Why was that situation, why was that instituted in our society? Exactly, someone said it, to be fair. Because once upon a time, during the dark ages, a judge would sit there and make all the decisions and then sentence you. And to be a judge, what had to happen? You obviously had to fit in with the system, didn't you? But with a, a jury of 12 of your peers, they make hopefully, <laughs> a decision in your case, understanding, you know, your situation. It's not an arbitrary decision by a judge. So our judicial system, we're blessed to have as a result of the Protestant Reformation. The, the right to vote in our government comes from the Protestant Reformation. Before that, it was an arbitrary king. A king said, this is the law and that's it. You had no say in the matter. There are so many aspects of our society that we we are blessed with because of the Protestant Reformation. And Rome wants to undo all of that. They want a judicial system where a judge makes an arbitrary decision in your case. They don't want you to have any say in who your government is. That's what they're aiming to do. And to do that, they have to disrupt our current system. Does that make sense? The democracy we have, where we can vote in council members for the local council, boom, gone. So do you think we're starting to see things happening in New Zealand to undo the system that we've inherited? Yes. Is there talk about, have you heard of co-governance, where unelected people will have positions of authority? That's straight out of Roman Catholic thinking. God's word has given warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded, and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are only when it's too late to escape the snare. She's silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches, and in the hearts of men. People today don't appreciate what we have as with our Protestant heritage. You know what I'm saying. 
They don't understand why we have the systems that we do. They just want to overturn it, have revolution, and sadly, it's going to go that way. Notice what it says in Great Controversy. Stealthily and unsuspectedly, she, this is speaking about the Roman Church, is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. Now, what does that mean, to strike? If you say, do you know what a strike is? We're not talking about labor unions stopping work. Have you heard about a snake striking? What, is, what happens when a snake strikes? <laughs> Holds back and then suddenly, unexpectedly, boom. So there's going to be a, a strike come, shall we say. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. And I believe we're right on the cusp of this. We're seeing things happening in the world today. Is there evidence that the COVID-19 pandemic was planned to take away our rights? You know, there's a great clue in the Bible, and some of you may have seen this already. That harlot woman in Revelation 17 is talked about in chapter 18, verse 23. It says, By thy sorceries were all nations deceived. So that harlot woman in Revelation 17 deceived the nations. It says, By her sorceries. Now, what does sorceries mean? The Greek word you can see is pharmakia. Which basically, the first definition, according to Strong's, is, can you see what that says? The use or the administering of drugs. Or number two, poisoning. It's where we get the word pharmacy from. You could literally translate that for by thy drug pushes, by thy pharmaceuticals, where all nations deceive. Yes, exactly. Yes. That's right, the mindset's changing, even in the medical world, sadly. And you can see where this could lead to. Thankfully, things have pulled back. We don't have a vaccine pass. But you look at some of the key figures behind all this. If we're on the right track, and if we believe Rome is behind a lot of this, we should see evidence of that in some of the key figures. If you heard of this gentleman here, <laughs> he was the leading advisor to the presidents for many years, at least five presidents, I believe. And there's evidence that he was behind funding gain-of-function research. Originally, they were doing this in the United States, and they were told by the government to stop researching gain-of-function and viruses. So then funding was sent by that same gentleman to China, where the research continued. Would you like to hazard a guess? And again, if you go to public sources of information, Wikipedia, look at the background of some of these key players. For example, the heads of the CIA, many of these people, the FBI. For example, you look at the education background of Anthony Fauci. What do we read in public sources of information? Fauci attended Regis High School, a private Jesuit school in Manhatt Manhattan's Upper East Side. And you'll see there's a pattern. If you do your homework, look at where some of these leading figures were educated. There's a pattern. It's interesting what Fauci said back in 2017. He said, there is no doubt Donald J. Trump, so we're talking six years ago before, um, just when Trump came in as president, there is no doubt Donald J. Trump will be confronted with a surprise infectious disease outbreak during his presidency. Do you get that? And down below it says, Fauci said Trump administration will not only be challenged by ongoing global health threats such as influenza and HIV, but also a surprise disease outbreak. How can you state categorically there's going to be a surprise <laughs> unless you had some inside information and it was planned? Exactly. And it's interesting now, there's a lot of information coming out. There's a lot of questions being asked. 
And there's almost like a backlash coming in the mainstream media. For example, Senator Rand Paul asking questions. Emails are coming out which shows that people knew a lot more than what the mainstream media was letting on. And there's going to be a backlash. And it's interesting, I believe, and I'll share some thoughts here. I'm not a prophet, but here's some thoughts. This backlash is going to be controlled because it's playing right into the devil's hands as well. Satan is a master. You've heard of the old Punch and Judy show where the puppet master had two puppets fighting each other, but he was controlling both of them. That's the situation we've got here. Satan is a master at pushing society one way so that he can swing it as hard as he can the opposite way. Isn't that how it works? Satan wants society there, so he'll push it this way until there's a reaction, and then he'll swing it back. And we're seeing that today, aren't we? We see the liberalism, the wokeism, permeating society, and there's a groundswell against it because Satan wants it to swing the opposite way. When Sunday laws come in, it won't be by the LGBT, etc. community. It'll be by the conservative Christians saying we need to enforce morality. Is that right? So it's being pushed one way so it can swing back the other way. So where is this all going to result? And here's an amazing quote from the book Education. And look at how this fits. This is talking about what led to the French Revolution. It says, The centralizing of wealth and power, the vast combinations for the enriching of the few at the expense of the many. Does that sound familiar? Do we see some people getting super rich today while there's a lot of poverty in the world? The combinations of the poorer classes for the defense of their interests and claims. You're going to see this, this uh, labor union movement build up again. You know, we need to fight for better wages and conditions. The spirit of unrest, of riot and bloodshed. The worldwide dissemination of the same teachings that led to the French Revolution, which was there is no God. Do we see atheism as part of our education system? All are tending to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. And what happened in France? The, yes, the, the monarchy was, shall we say, abusing their power. And the masses were in poverty while the, the royalty were living it up. And the people got sick of it. They said, we've had enough of this. And they rose up. And there was a revolution. And then the revolution took on a a mind of its own, so to speak. And they'd say, anybody who's against the revolution, what do you do with them? Get rid of them, chop their heads off. Sorry about the picture not being there. I hope it's not my laptop playing up. Oh, there we go. And we're going to see the same again. We're going to see this revolution coming, I believe, where they're going to say, we need to get things back to, to what it should be. And anyone who opposes this movement is going to be seen as an enemy of the state, an enemy of the revolution. Here's an interesting statement from manuscript 114. Look at this. Here's a snapshot, a prophetic snapshot of situations which must be in the future based on what we read here. In India, China, Russia, and the cities of America... Thousands of men and women are dying of starvation. Now, was that happening in 1899? I'd say no. There weren't people starving in American cities in 1899, not thousands. I believe this is a snapshot of what's going to happen in the future. It says the moneyed men, because they have the power, control the market. They purchase at low rates all they can obtain, then sell at greatly increased prices. This means starvation of the poorer classes and will result in a civil war. Here's some other interesting things. What about the economic world? Are we seeing tremendous challenges there? Here's an amazing statement. In the future, strange things will happen. I tell you this so that you may not be surprised at what takes place. Under the leadership of Satan, there are men who today are doing all in their power to plunge the world into commercial strife. Thus Satan is trying to bring about a condition of things that will make the world uncivilized. 
ties right in with the French Revolution happening globally again. There are people trying to crash the economy. Why? Because Satan wants to do that. But the good thing is, ultimately, God is going to turn things around. All these happenings in the world are just the backdrop for what God is going to do with his people to give the last warning message to the world. And the ten horns which thou sawest, thee shall hate the whore, shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So ultimately, God's going to turn things around, but by then, of course, it's too late. Probation will be closed. They'll, people will realize they're lost, and they'll hate the system that led them down that track. And the prophecy says, reward her, even as she rewards you, and double unto her double according to her works. But what does it mean for us as these events start taking place? It says, Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We may be seen as anti-government, anti-revolutionary. We're going to be hated for what we stand for. But you know, what we have to go through is nothing compared to what Jesus did for us. And there's that wonderful promise that we won't be tempted above what we're able. Even though it may not seem like it at the time, God's hand will be there. He will be controlling exactly what's happening to us because God is using that whole crisis as a process to prepare his people for a second coming. It says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The message for us is be faithful, endure to the end, because God is going to do something wonderful. All of this trouble in the world is just the preparation that God is using circumstances, the backdrop for him to prepare a people that are going to live with him for eternity. And so on that note, shall we close with a prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we thank you, Lord, for your word the sure word of prophecy. Lord, we know what's coming upon the world. We can read an inspiration. And Lord, while humanly it may give us reason to pause and reason to be concerned, Lord, we know we needn't fear anything because you are the sovereign of the universe. So Lord, we ask that you'll guide us, lead us, help us to be ready for whatever work you have for us to do, that we can help hasten your second coming and finish this great controversy once and for all. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. <coughs> Actually, extremely well. I was blown away because a lot of them said, we know this. We know who's behind all this. And I thought, wow. So a lot of them are actually doing their homework. Perhaps because we aren't doing our job. <laughs> you know, God is using others to wake up who's actually pulling the strings behind the scenes. Of about... 15 people we had in the home, two people left halfway through, and I can guess what religion they were. The other, the rest of them just said, we, we see it. We have, don't have any problem with it. So, yeah, I was very encouraged. <laughs> so people, people are waking up, eh? It's amazing. They can see something isn't right. And I think a lot of them can see who's behind it.